Jeremy Suri is a professor of history and holds the Mac Brown Distinguished Chair for Leadership in Global Affairs at the University of Texas. He's the author and editor of nine books on contemporary politics and foreign policy, including Henry Kissinger and the American Century and Liberty's Surest Guardian, American Nation Building from the Founders to Obama. Suri also writes for major newspapers and magazines, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Houston Chronicle, the Boston Globe, Foreign Affairs, and Wired. And as I said, he will be joined on stage tonight by the one and only Rajiv Chandasekharan, who has served for two decades as a senior correspondent and associate editor of the Washington Post. During his newspaper career, he reported from more than three dozen countries and was bureau chief in Baghdad, Cairo, and Southeast Asia. In 2014, he co-wrote with Howard Schultz the best-selling book, For Love of Country, What Our Veterans Can Teach Us About Citizenship, Heroism, and Sacrifice. They're here tonight to discuss Suri's latest book, The Impossible Presidency. Jeremy, it's a real pleasure to be with you here tonight. Um, welcome to Seattle. Thank you. And congratulations on this uh, remarkable book. Thank you. Um, in some ways, uh, impeccably timed. <laughs> uh, Maybe we wish otherwise, right? <laughs> well, you know, it's what this book does that uh, so few uh, works of nonfiction uh, that are sort of published in, in recent years uh, have done is, you know, you use the power of history and the long arc of American history uh, to really help us illuminate the present. And there's an incredible value to to going back in that and uh, uh, not just recounting and reminding us of some of the uh, most impactful uh, occupants of the, of the White House uh, and, and the pre-White House, but um, uh, helping to illuminate aspects of their leadership in new ways uh, and through uh, taking and defining that connective tissue, helping us see a bigger picture. Um, so if, if I may, I, I, you know, everyone's here really to hear, hear you speak. Um, let, me, let me start out by asking you uh, to talk about the presidency uh, writ large and to go back 200 plus years and, and help us understand what did, what did our founding fathers uh, envision the presidency to be? What did they expect out of this office? Because their expectations are very different than the modern office. Right, right. No, I think that's, that's the uh, uh, most important question to start with and very well put. Uh, the Founding Fathers expected uh, the presidency to be a very small office. And they expected the president to have a role in unifying the country, but they did not expect the president to be a day-to-day -day decision maker and they certainly did not expect the president to be determining the fate of the lives of millions of citizens on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they expected this would be an office that would serve a primary executive function in uniting the country and laying out a vision for the country, but then leaving the other organs of government to do the day-to-day -day governing of the country. So a very, very limited. Very thing. limited, very limited, and in some ways uh, separate from the people. Uh, they thought the president should come from the people, but the president should not be on a day-to-day -day basis managing the people. Uh, one other point that's worth making is that they saw the office in the terms of James Madison as a paragon of virtue. This was to be an office that would inspire. Uh, Lincoln would later say it would be the office that would help bring out the better angels in our nature. Uh, but it's interesting when you read the Federalist Papers, when you go back to the original documents, the, the word they use most often for describing the qualifications of the president is virtue. How far we've fallen. Yes. <laughs> um, so the first occupant of this office, George Washington, a great military general. Um, it's his in some ways, even though the founders had envisioned this and um, the, the Constitution, the, 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 our very new Constitution, uh, started to spell out powers for this office. Uh, help us understand how George Washington uh, himself envisioned the office and how he actually sought to govern uh, 
as our first president. Right. It, 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 the most important point is that Washington actually creates the office, not the Constitution. Article 2 of the Constitution is quite vague. And that's in large part because the founders didn't have agreement on what the office should look like. And they were inventing something that was brand new. It had not existed before. One of the points I came across in my research that I make in the book is that the term executive was not even used as a noun until the founders started using it that way. So they didn't know what to envision. Washington had to create the office. And he saw himself, and this is clear in his diaries that are available that I relied heavily on, he saw his role as creating a sense of Americanness. Uh, what I try to explain to my students all the time is that uh, citizens living in Georgia and in Massachusetts at the time did not call themselves Americans. They called themselves Georgians or whatever people in Massachusetts call themselves. I still don't know. Patriots fans, I guess, or whatever. <laughs> um, and Washington saw his role as creating an American identity. And the president was the person to do that because he was the only person who represented all Americans. And he was the only person charged to defend the document that united all Americans, which was the Constitution. So it's interesting, for example, during the Whiskey Rebellion, which is the first military undertaking, undertaking led by the President of the United States. He's, by the way, Washington, the first president and the last president to lead soldiers into battle himself. He uses that war to actually bring together the states, not to forge a professional military. He uses the war as a means of building a common identity. He does the same thing with uh, the development of an economic plan. Uh, Lynn Mir Miranda's play is wonderful on Hamilton, but he kind of gets it a little wrong because Washington didn't see himself arbitrating between Jefferson and Hamilton. He saw himself adopting and supporting all elements that would build a common nation. And that's what Hamilton's economic plan did. It wasn't that he agreed with Hamilton over Jefferson, but he believed the United States needed a single capital market, it needed an infrastructure plan, and it needed a currency, all of which were at the foundation of Hamilton's plan. One other thing, Washington uh, emphasizes education. And he proposes a national public university. We end up creating universities at the state level, as you know. Uh, but he really creates a dialogue about national education, arguing that we have to educate the citizenry if we're going to have a common nation of Americans. But in his quest to bring this new country together, to forge this American identity, um, he is more modest in his use of executive power, as it Absolutely. were, than it might otherwise be to, to try to accomplish this goal. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, uh, Washington was allergic to the, uh, any trappings of monarchical power. And so many of the models of executive authority, the issuing of orders, the huge entourage, uh, the regal clothing, he rejected all of that. None of that's in the Constitution. He rejects that. Um, and his modesty is most on display, quite frankly, in his desire to be seen less as someone above the people, but more as someone who is still of the people. He spends a lot of his presidency traveling around the country, meeting with ordinary citizens. His diary is filled with his uh, collecting data on how much it costs to run a farm in different parts of the country, because he's a farmer himself. He's interested in farming markets. He's interested in all of that. He does not want to be seen as anything that looks, sounds, feels, or smells like a king. That said, there is still, right, this sort of uh, popular view at the time that, that he is uh, sort of a figure above right. all. And, and same with his successors, right? Because uh, the next president that you chronicle in this book is Andrew Jackson. Right. Um, and that's a, Jackson rides to power, um, and they're wonderful sort of, as you read these, these, these pages, um, you can't help but think of 2016. Um, but, but Jackson rides to power in a very different way and with a very different um, view of um, the office and uh, one that despite Washington's desire to connect with the common man, really the office is not an office of the common. Correct, right. Jackson's criticism, and it's a criticism that will be raised with every generation of Americans, is that what is dispassionate to some is exclusionary to others. And so Washington's, disp Washington's dispassionate approach to the presidency for Jackson continues to empower those who already have power, which are the Virginia Gentry and the Boston Brahmins, 
and leaves out those like Jackson who were born in the Carolinas and have to struggle scraping together their lives, moving west to get land and establishing themselves on a dangerous frontier surrounded by Indians. He sees Washington's approach as too limiting for the needs of those on the frontier. And so he seeks to bring the presidency quite literally to the frontier, to citizens uh, close to dangerous areas. He uses his military experience to justify his position. And he argues that those who are from elite Northeastern backgrounds are corrupting power and should be removed. That's his attack on the Bank of the United States. And he seeks to empower uh, those who he thinks are ordinary people representative of the frontier and uses what's called the spoils system to put his own people uh, into government. So he's a critic of expertise because he sees expertise as elitist and argues instead for a more what we will call populist approach to governance. In so doing, how does he transform the office? Well, he does two things that uh, leave an important legacy for Lincoln and, and, and others. First of all, um, he brings the president out from behind Congress. He's the first president to really stand in front of Congress and establish not just independent power, but in some ways uh, executive supremacy over Congress. And that's most famous uh, in the debates over infrastructure and the debates over Indian warfare. But the second thing uh, Jackson does is he makes the president a personality, a charismatic personality for ordinary citizens. It's hard for us to imagine, but Washington was a deeply respected figure. He wasn't seen as a charismatic figure. He wasn't seen as a figure in everyone's lives. Uh, there's a kind of ubiquity to Jacksonian America where his image begins to appear everywhere, and the president is now seen as someone who is at least an image connecting to the ordinary citizens at large. So he makes the president much more publicly powerful. And this will be important for Lincoln when Lincoln seeks to use language uh, from the presidency to actually redefine the nation in the context of the Civil War. Just level set for us, you know, in, in the Jackson administration, how, how big was the kind of executive office of the president? Oh, quite small, quite small. He had a staff of, I think, two people, and then he had cabinet secretaries. Um, and as late as the 1930s, Herbert Hoover will have a staff of five. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt has to beg to double the staff size. Um, so it's, it's still actually a, a very small office. Um, until uh, the administration of William Howard Taft, you could pretty much go up to the door and knock on the White House. And someone would, sometimes the president would actually come and open the door for you. I mean, during, during Lincoln's presidency, there was a, a queue of people waiting for office hours. He, he, he had office hours uh, one morning, sometimes two mornings a week and that was considered normal. Uh, Jackson and Theodore Roosevelt had inauguration parties where tens of thousands of people trampled through the White House. In both cases, the building was almost destroyed by the people who, uh, who came through, by the rabbling masses that came through the White House. Uh, by contrast, how big, uh, I mean, there are different ways to slice this, but you know, the executive office of the presidency, uh, sort of, you know, when you add in White House staff, uh, and uh, everything that sort of falls under the executive these days, how big? Uh, thousands, right? The NSC staff alone, the National Security Council is 450 people. That's just the National Security Council. The way I usually describe this to people is by uh, looking at the executive office building. Many of you have seen the executive office building, that beautiful late 19th century French imperial style building next to the White House. That used to house until 1943, Department of Navy, Department of War, and the State Department. Now it's all the president's staff. And, and it's not up. big enough. There's a new executive office building next to it. Precisely. So that gives you a size of the scale. But we could say the same about universities. <laughs> right? Now, it's, it, and that's not even counting the size of cabinet agencies. And Correct. Forth, which yeah. at, at that time were minuscule. Right. This is a really important point. I mean, the, the, the founders do not envision the size and complexity of our society. And one of the things that's made the office impossible, I argue, is that the office is not built for the complex problems on a global scale that we face today. It has lasted, it has been stitched together, but it really is not uh, capable of dealing with these problems, and we can discuss that further. We'll get to that in a second. Let, let, let me, let me uh, ask you, let, so the, the, there's the third president, let's go a little chronologically here, um, because we can't have a discussion like this and not talk about Abraham Lincoln. Right. But, um, what I'm most curious about, I mean, so many of us are, have read various things about the Lincoln presidency, perhaps seen a popular movie, 
uh, familiar with certain speeches he's given and you know, broadly understand the contours of the Civil War. But you draw a connective tissue between Andrew Jackson and Abraham Lincoln. And, yes. and help draw that for us tonight. Help us understand what Abraham Lincoln draws, in part from Washington, but also really from Andrew Jackson. Yes, yes, and, and this is one of the great things about doing historical research. You get to go back and read the original materials. And Lincoln makes reference to Jackson all the time in his letters and elsewhere. He revered Andrew Jackson uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, he really revered the fact that Andrew Jackson tried to bring American governance to ordinary citizens like himself. Uh, Abraham Lincoln is much closer to Jackson than Washington in his background. He's a propertyless uh, white man born on the frontier. Slavery is the bane of his existence. Jackson did not hate slavery. Lincoln hates slavery because slavery is actually bringing down his wage. Makes it harder to get a job. I mean, Jackson was a slaveholder. Uh, Jackson was a, a huge slaveholder. Uh, if you go to the Hermitage, you see the, this, the huge miles of um, slave quarters. But uh, Jackson spoke to the ordinary citizen, the ordinary white man, and the Republican Party, for which Lincoln is a pioneer and the first president, was a party that spoke to ordinary white men on the frontier in an urban society, not elite white men. And so that ordinariness, that populism, is an important part of Lincoln. Lincoln revered the way Jackson communicated. He was not nearly as eloquent as Lincoln would become. But Jackson was the first president to be able to communicate to ordinary citizens effectively, uh, sometimes in an off-color way, but he did it nonetheless. But most of all, what, what Lincoln really took uh, from Jackson was the notion that the president had to embody something deeper in the American body politic. That there had to be not just a unifying, dispassionate, virtuous element to the office that Lincoln embodied as well, but there had to be something deeper about the spirit of the American people. And the president was to vocalize that, to evoke that. So the Gettysburg Address, the second inaugural, are filled with Jacksonian references as much as they are with Washington references. References to a deeper spirit within the people and a return to the Declaration of Independence as the deeper spiritual core text for American identity. Now, as, as Lincoln prosecutes the Civil War. What happens to the office of the presidency? And, and how does the, the Civil War uh, redefine uh, what, uh, what the presidency is in America? Sure. So there, let me be as specific about this as I can be. And when the Civil War begins, uh, Abraham Lincoln has to go hat in hand, literally, to governor after governor asking them for soldiers. He has no power in the Constitution to conscript citizens. By 1863, because of the necessities of the war and because governors don't want to be responsible for providing citizens, Congress passes the Conscription Act, which allows the President of the United States to requisition the bodies and lives of citizens and force them into battle. Uh, that's an enormous increase in the power of the President. Uh, the President takes on not just war-making powers, he takes on domestic regulatory powers without the regulatory agencies yet that no other president uh, had taken on before, and presidents will never give up that power. It's the beginning of a different kind of warfare, a more constant warfare in American society. And then you have the Emancipation Proclamation. And of course, uh, the uh, other side of that coin is the ending of slavery and the Emancipation Proclamation that ends slavery in the Confederacy, only in the Confederacy. The Emancipation Proclamation is, a war, is an, an act of war. It's a war order. Lincoln uses the uh, pressure of the war to justify, and he does that to requisition freed slave bodies from the South and move them into the Union armies and move them behind Union lines. So that's a, a function of ending slavery, but it's also a function of war powers. And it's important, uh, because people often forget this, or intentionally forget this, the um, emancipation of slavery, and then with the end of slavery in the 13th Amendment, that is the largest single transfer of power and wealth that occurs anywhere in the world in the 19th century, and it's done by the president, initially by a presidential signature, uh, right? Because slavery is the core of Southern wealth. That wealth is being redistributed from Southern owners to others, to the slaves themselves. That is the largest redistribution of wealth uh, in the 19th century. So anyone who says the United States has never redistributed wealth doesn't know their history. <laughs> and, and done initially by, by simply by executive order. Uh, by an act of war, by a war order, which is an executive order, yes. So um, let's move forward a little bit in history. Um, 
I dare say that if you went into the crowd at a Bernie Sanders rally and you asked people, so who was our country's first progressive president? You might not get the answer that you proffer up in this book. Sure, sure. So who was our first progressive president, Jeremy? Well, I think our first progressive president was clearly, and still perhaps one of our most progressive presidents, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was far more progressive than Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson's language sounds more progressive, but Theodore Roosevelt is a man well ahead of his times. First of all, he's much more um, willing to be racially inclusive. Uh, but more than that, Theodore Roosevelt, who reveres Abraham Lincoln, and one of the points here is every generation learns in the prior generation, Theodore Roosevelt believes the president must use his power to improve society for all people especially for those who have been left behind. And he's very much taken with bringing the best ideas from technocrats and experts and various activists, including women activists like Jane Addams, into the White House and using the bully pulpit, as he calls it, to instill, encourage, and incentivize reform around the country. He does this by breaking up the railroad trusts, by breaking up Standard Oil. I tell, always tell my friends in Houston, Houston exists because of Theodore Roosevelt breaking up Standard Oil, he makes it possible for Houston to exist. Um, but he goes well beyond that. Uh, he puts his power, he puts his words behind uh, the creation of national parks, which are to provide green space, breathing space for people in urban slums. He puts his power behind uh, creating some of the first regulations for uh, city labor, city cleanliness, pollution, urban living. Uh, he's very taken with Jacob Reese's work on the other half, how the other half lives. Uh, so he's really instituting, from the first uh, time, the White House uh, anti-poverty, progressive legislation, progressive measures to improve the lives of ordinary citizens. He's the man in the arena who's yeah. living, you know, the, the strenuous life. Yes, and uh, I have to say, um, what one journalist says about Theodore Roosevelt, you feel when you read his materials, uh, this journalist that at the time, that you would shake Theodore Roosevelt's hand and then you would go home and wring him out of your clothes. And as you read the material, like John F. Kennedy still charms you when you read his letters. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt still gets into you. There's so much en energy and dynamism. He's a man in the hurry. He's a man in the arena. He's a man who thinks he can bring the best brains and the best brawn together. And uh, he's hyperactive. We would say today he had ADD. Right? He's a hyperactive individual. But is the... Is, is the, the, the structure that's being built around the presidency at this point able to kind of keep up with his hyperactivity? It, it is, uh, because what Theodore Roosevelt is, is doing is still very personalistic, mm -hmm. and there's not much bureaucracy behind it. It's still a relatively simple society. The American society of the early 20th century looks so much different from our society today in terms of the numbers, in terms of the scale. The communication's much slower but things are much easier to manage, and he can have relationships with most of the key players in most of the key parts of the country and manage those relationships almost unmediated himself. That becomes impossible by the time we get to the middle of the 20th century. But before we get to the middle, we get to the 12 years of Franklin Delano mm -hmm. Roosevelt. And you essentially argue in this book that he's sort of, he's the greatest president we've had. I think that's right. And, um, and he really defines the modern American <coughs> presidency. Yes. And so kind of a two-part question. What, give us the, the short version of your argument of, of why FDR is really the model American president. And where does he go beyond Teddy in, in, in really shaping the, the institution of the American presidency that, that exists today? So uh, it's a great question. Uh, the United States obviously doesn't develop the kinds of uh, social welfare state mechanisms in the early 20th century that other European states develop, in part because we don't really have an active socialist party and in part because we have enough wealth that we don't have to do quite as much economic redistribution. Uh, but Franklin Roosevelt is the first president to really take on the task of helping those who are left behind. If Theodore Roosevelt wanted to provide some presidential mechanism for limiting the damage, the soot, the harm, the brutality of an industrial society, Franklin Roosevelt really makes himself a national healer. That's what I call him. And I, and I think it comes from an insight he gets uh, as being such a privileged person. He comes from the privileged of the privileged. I like to say that if 
George H.W. Bush was born with a uh, silver spoon in his mouth, as Ann Richards said. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt had the whole China set in his <laughs> mouth when he was born. Uh, not only did he come from an elite family uh, with plenty of money, uh, he had a mother who was 20 years younger than his father. So he was his mother's companion. He's the last president, by the way, to collect an allowance from his mommy while he's in office. Uh, the, the, he had one, one woman, above all, who was important in his life. It was Sarah Roosevelt, his mom. Uh, so he had all the advantages, but then he contracts in the 1920s this horrible disease of polio. And here's the thing. He spends three years of his life in Warm Springs, Georgia, with some of the most destitute Americans. And not on a fly-by visit. He lives with them. He sees their lives, and he recognizes, I think, the most important insight that we as historians transfer, I hope, to our students and others, which is to remind us all that you know, we're sitting in this room because we've been successful, but a few turns in our lives and we could be somewhere else. You need to be good, but you need to be lucky. And there are lots of good people who aren't lucky. Roosevelt recognizes that. He recognizes that. He, like Washington and Lincoln, wants to unite the country. Like TR, he wants to push the country forward. But he also recognizes that people are going to be left behind. Here is the historical truth of capitalism. It produces more wealth and perhaps more innovation than any other system, but it always leaves some people behind. There's never been a capitalist system that doesn't leave some people behind. And he steps in and makes the presidency in the time of a de depression, the time of our worst economic downturn, into a lifeboat for millions of Americans. He offers them hope, not handouts. He offers them an opportunity to re-engage, to connect, to feel that their suffering is not alone, that they're with others, that they have hope, that they have possibility. And he brings Americans together in that moment. And that makes him enormously powerful as president. It provides the foundation not only for coming out of the Depression, but for winning World War II. We win World War II because we are a more cooperative society, not because we have the best soldiers. And it creates a standard and an expectation for all presidents thereafter. It's interesting to see this in the oral histories, uh, how people talk about they never expected a president to do this, but they'll never forget that presidents can do this. And so it creates an expectation that's very difficult for other presidents to take on. And by 1945, when Franklin Roosevelt dies as a very sick man, he's not only done this for the United States, uh, he's now promising to do it for the world. Uh, the United Nations Charter, the Atlantic Charter, they promise a new deal for the world. So Roosevelt's the first global president promising a new deal for the world, in part because we see that as the alternative to fascism and communism. And so think about the responsibility that the presidency has then in 1945, and it's, it, it is a different universe from where Washington was, even from where Lincoln was. Does he create shoes that are too big to fill? Yes. I think he barely manages this himself. Uh, and he still benefits from society being a bit smaller and a bit less complex, but I think they are shoes that no one can fill. What I show in the book, for example, is that almost every president who comes after him, including Ronald Reagan, tries to be Roosevelt. In fact, some, like Kennedy, hire scholars to tell them how Roosevelt did it. Many think tanks develop to advise. Obama tries this, right? He spends his transition period reading about FDR's first hundred days. But none of them are able to do it because the scale of the problem is too great, the office is too small, and most of all, the responsibilities pull them in too many directions. They end up doing exactly what Lyndon Johnson does, contradicting themselves. We build upon what you just said. The scale of the problem is too great, the size of the office is too small. Um, I'm going to jump ahead for a second, but build upon that. Should we have a bigger, more resourced, uh, kind of presidency, uh, a bigger White House, uh, uh, a bigger executive structure to, to deal with the raft of, of challenges that presidents face, that we've come to expect presidents uh, to, to take on? Or do we need to vastly rescope what the president does and, and essentially kind of uh, turn, turn back uh, or, or uh, readjust the course yes. that FDR sent us on? So certainly the latter. What we have done more of, uh, in fact, what, what every administration does until the current one, and I'm only commenting on the history here, right? The current administration's not history yet, maybe soon, hopefully soon. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, what every administration does after Roosevelt is the, the first of those things. It increases the size of the White House. This was starting to happen earlier. <laughs> 
but the executive office grows exponentially after that point. The 1947 National Security Act creates a National Security Council that becomes a mini State Department within the, the White House. Um, and you see this happening with a domestic policy council, all sorts of areas. Remember, FDR starts out with five staff members, and we're in the thousands now. So every president tries to manage the greater complexity of the world by creating a larger executive, and it never works because there's never enough. The problems of the world always exceed the office. One of the interesting things that Jeremy does in this book is uh, for, for some of the more modern presidents, you, um, you reprise some of their daily schedules. So you can see what JFK's day looked, a, re, a day in the life of JFK looked like, and, uh, and LBJ and, and Clinton. Um, but you know, FDR faced, you know, America under FDR faced you know, a seemingly existential crisis mm -hmm. with um, uh, Japanese aggression in the Pacific and Pearl Harbor, with uh, the march of fascism in Europe, and yet he wasn't engulfed no. by the crisis, crisis of the Great Depression, the crisis of the Second World War. And as, as you take us through the administrations of JFK, for instance, and the Cuban Missile Crisis, you see how Kennedy was engulfed by that. And Vietnam War, you know, tore apart LBJ. Why is it? Why was FDR able to not get distracted, not get engulfed? Why did, why did it essentially subsume these other right. presidencies? Right. Because leadership in the end is about synthesizing and prioritizing. And it was a bit easier for him to synthesize and prioritize because although there were lots and lots of people who were suffering and lots and lots of fascist threats, they were relatively easy to identify and categorize and deal with in synthetic ways. So the depression for FDR was a very simple problem. It was a problem of jobs. People needed jobs. He says time and again, the, there's only one thing we're doing, jobs, 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 and more jobs. All the New Deal programs are designed to create jobs. And when fighting Nazi Germany and Japan, there are lots of strategic tactical details, and FDR gets caught up in a lot of that, but it's always about defeating fascism full stop. Not defeating communism, defeating fascism, right? So he's willing to work with the communists if he has to. He's going to give them aid, help Stalin along. And he has, because he synthesizes these issues, a relatively limited number of uh, players he has to work with. And he can bring in, on his own side, new ideas within those synthesized priorities. What happens after FDR, because we've taken on so much, and there's so many parts of the world, so many programs at home we're dealing with, is that the issues become harder to categorize, harder to synthesize, and you have more mobilized groups arguing for each of them. You see in the calendars of the presidents a world of FDR that's not organized around special interests and a world of John F. Kennedy that is organized around special interests. By the way, some of the special interests are the leaders of newly independent countries as well as special interests at home. And so presidents start spending their time not synthesizing the problems, but finding ways to give goodies to everyone. That's how you get elected, that's how you stay in office. Is this, is, despite more recent occupants of the office uh, who in different ways have, have had their, uh, you know, who you could argue are, are, are very talented, Absolutely. capable, brilliant people, Obama, Clinton, even, even you know, an assessment of Reagan, um, have they just lacked that discipline? Um, is it their fault, or is it is it more broadly structural? Is it that you know uh, money and special interests have infused? Uh, you're in a more kind of toxic environment vis-a-vis -vis the Congress. Um, why? How much of the blame for this impossibility rests with the occupants of the Oval Office uh, versus? the way that the overall system uh, has developed. Well, there's obviously a bit of both, but it is, I argue in the book, structural. It is about the system, which uh, puts presidents from the moment they enter office in perpetual crisis mode, perpetual reactive mode. And what you see in the schedules uh, is what happens in a lot of our lives now, too. We spend the entire day solving someone else's problems, not what's actually important uh, to us.
And that's because we're involved in so many things and there's a proliferation of crises and presidents, especially in a modern media environment, are under pressure to respond immediately to so many things. So the dirty secret when you do the research is there's actually very little strategic thought. There's actually very little deep deliberation. There's a lot of fast reaction, right? Clinton calls this the war room and he's a war room for everything. Um, so presidents could discipline themselves more. They could try and I show how Reagan tried to do that. But even Reagan gets pulled into this maelstrom. And I think the lesson coming from this is certainly we could have better presidents who are better disciplined and more knowledgeable, more informed, and have better advisors. But even if Franklin Roosevelt or Abraham Lincoln in their prime walked in today, they would have many of the same problems. And so we need to think about reforming the office. We have an 18th century office contending with 21st century problems. And that is an incompatibility. No one would run a corporation today in the way they ran railroads in the 1870s. Yet we seem to run the presidency the way we ran farms in the 18th century. I'll be able to ask you two quick questions and then we'll, we'll open it up to the audience. And I'm gonna come back to that point in a second. But I, I, I wanna ask you about um, the last election, if I could. There are a lot of uh, reasons that have been advanced for uh, Donald Trump's victory, uh, a lot of proximate causes. Uh, but your kind of closing line of the book, and I'm sorry, you know, spoiler alert here, but you know, is uh, you say the impossible presidency produced a truly impossible president. Um, so does, does the office, do the previous occupants of the office, um, in your view, bear responsibility for where we are today? Yes, yes. Now, that's not to say that the majority of the responsibility is theirs, uh, but they have failed, Democrat and Republican, to educate us about what really goes on. And it's not because they're hiding things, uh, it's because um, that, that's hard medicine for, our, for a society that wants Superman to solve our problems. Uh, I love Obama. I think Obama was a, a remarkable person. I think he was a man of virtue, by the way and integrity, he was, he was scandal-free Obama, more scandal-free than any president before him for at least 20 years, certainly more scandal-free than the president after him. Um, but part of Obama's allure for many people was that he was the Messiah. Yes, he can, right? Yes, we can, but it really meant yes, he can. Um, and, and I think uh, it's hard medicine for Americans to be educated on the fact that our problems are not gonna be solved by Superman. And we needed a presidency that does a better job, an office that does a better job in engaging all of us in solving our problems. Uh, that's not about less government or more government. It's about focused government. The conversation we need to have is about what are our national priorities? How do we align our national priorities behind this enormous power that we possess? If we think the environment is a priority, we better put more in, in that. If we think that healthcare is a priority, we better do more of that. But instead, we're doing so much in so many different places, we're not doing anything well. And prior occupants have been part of that problem as much as the current one. I'd like to just read a couple of lines from the epilogue uh, and ask you to comment on them. <clears throat> After Donald Trump, improved national leadership will require remaking the office, the larger governance of the United States, and the expectations of the public. The inherited presidency is no longer the correct presidency for the 21st century nor is Trump's anti-presidency a constructive alternative. The United States needs a new burst of institutional reform, not just endless debate about who should be president. What does that institutional reform amount to? Well, I'm optimistic that is happening. I actually think Donald Trump has now made that more likely. Uh, I'm a believer, this goes back to uh, an earlier book I wrote on the 60s, I'm a believer in what the German social activist of the 60s, Rudi Dutschke, called the long march through the institutions. And I think the institutions change when a new generation goes in and reshapes the institutions to address the problems of their time. I think a new generation of leaders, many of those who are running for office now, who we should all go out and support and vote for, a young generation of leaders, many of them women, want a presidency, they want members of Congress and others who are more representative of groups that have been left out. They want those in office who are focused on fewer problems and addressing those problems well. And most of all, they want people in office who are less dictators and more facilitators, more investors of government resources 
in pr projects and experiments that will make people's lives better. And I think that's gonna happen. My students, uh, my students think that way. They don't think as Democrats or Republicans. What's holding us back, what's keeping us in the old presidency are the old people in office, right? We had three 70-year-olds run for president. We have the second oldest Congress ever. The only one older was the one before it. It's the richest and the second oldest. Before this, we had the oldest and the second richest. Uh, that's the problem. That's the problem with our society. We're experiencing generational change. The institutions will become more problem-focused. Competency will become cool again uh, when a new generation of leaders uh, enter office. I'd like to open it up for questions, please. Well done nicely. I want to ask you about the evolution of the presidential identity as commander in chief and the impact that has had. Great question. Um, so, of course, the president is identified and empowered as commander in chief in the Constitution, but commander in chief of what is the question? Uh, the founders never envisioned a large standing military. Let's go well beyond the founders. Abraham Lincoln never envisioned that the largest army in the world that he created to win the Civil War would be permanent. Never envisioned that. Theodore Roosevelt envisioned a world-class navy, but he saw that as an alternative to a large standing army. The large permanent military industrial complex that the United States maintains after World War II, for some good reasons and for some bad reasons, it's a complex story, uh, makes the president as commander in chief now the wielder of more military power than anyone else in the world, and it is largely unchecked, largely unchecked. And if you think I'm wrong, just think about the procedures for a possible response to what would be perceived as a nuclear attack by North Korea, and who makes that decision and how it happens. It's basically a decision made by the President of the United States uh, with really the commander of American uh, nuclear forces. That, that's all, Congress will only be informed after the fact. Uh, so, Commander-in-Chief has come to mean things very different today, and we need to rethink the office very much so in that, in that capacity. Sir. My name is Randy Harrison. Um, quick, I have two quick questions, I think. Uh, one is that I got the distinct impression from reading Ron Chernow's biography of Washington that a primary reason that he came to agree with Hamilton's definition of a central power were the unending difficulties he had as the commanding general of the yes. Continental Army to get pay, food, uniforms, shoes, boots, whatever. So how do you see his role as, as the first general uh, affecting his later position on the yep. role of, of government? Second question is, what is what, how would you define, how would you look at the presidency, not Mr. Trump, but the office, and the internet? Wow, okay, good questions, Randy. Uh, so I first of all agree, and uh, Ron and I have used some of the same materials uh, on this. Washington is deeply affected by his period as commander of American Revolutionary Forces because he recognizes that the states in the Continental Congress are not operating as one, but operating as 12 different entities, and each of them passes the buck waiting for someone else to pay. Uh, which is why he thinks we need a unified entity. So I think that's absolutely right, and he says this quite explicitly. In terms of the internet and the presidency, uh, this is an area one should ask Rajiv as, as one of the leading journalists and thinkers about this, but, but um, my view is that every generation has to reinvent effective leadership communication in a new communication medium. So Roosevelt does this with the radio. Uh, well, Lincoln does this with the pen, right? Roosevelt does this with the radio. And Reagan does this to some extent, Kennedy, Reagan, that period, TV. We're in that moment on the internet, and no one has done it yet. What, what we have are a lot of people who have learned how to use the internet to get people angry and divide us. That's always the easy thing to do, and most technologies are first used to divide people. Who's gonna be the great unifier? Uh, it's gonna be someone who's probably uh, 16 years old, and she's sitting in a high school class right now, and she will figure out how to do this, right? And, uh, and then we'll look to her uh, 20 years from now, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that'll happen soon. The, maybe the only other thing to add yeah. from my point of view on that is that um, each of these sort of uh, disruptive technologies and the presidents who harness them, use them in a way to disintermediate communication. Yes. Yes. Um, in, in different ways felt frustrated by, the, by having their messages uh, essentially uh, interpreted uh, and channeled by the press. And so, uh, you know, Lincoln 
speaking directly to the people. Uh, FDR, again, using radio to speak directly right. to people. And, and, and you know, Trump isn't the first. You know, truth be told, the Obama White House right. uh, pushed out, you know, uh, sought to exclude media coverage from a lot right. of things and, and said, we're just going to live stream this. We're going to you know, use technology to go direct to people. Um, and so it's, it, is, it is something that presidents have long wanted to do, and they're simply harnessing the technologies available to I, them. I think that's right, but I, and I think building on that, um, niche communication is the oldest kind of communication. Uh, so if you go back to a, a city in the United States in the 1920s, you'll find most cities, I'm sure this was true of Seattle, had two, three, four newspapers. One newspaper was the Democratic paper, one was the Republican, one was the Socialist. Uh, and they spoke to their own communities, like Fox News and CNN tonight, today. This morning I was on the airplane, I had CNN on, the person next to me had Fox on, and they were two different worlds, right? Just as people would read two different newspapers, right? Presidents have sought you to use disruptive technology to go beyond that media division and to speak directly to the people, but to unite different groups. And Trump has not done that, right? Uh, the, so far, we've used media to disaggregate and further separate groups. The real innovation will be using it to bring groups together, I think. It's a very good point. Ma'am. Uh, Margaret Casey, um, you've sort of gone down the answer to my concern. If Congress would really assert itself and not let a president go to war without authority, yes. wouldn't that be one of the major steps yes. towards reforming? Because all that you describe about the presidency is built around warmongering. Correct. A lot could, of it is. And could I just, this is a sure. whole different topic, but would you comment on how, I can't imagine, I haven't been able to imagine how uh, President Trump could actually be smart enough to model himself on Andrew Jackson. Well, yeah, so let me answer that one first. I don't think he has modeled himself on Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson's populism, well, he claims a lot of things, right? I mean, <laughs> a Andrew Jackson's populism came from his authentic connection to people on the frontier. Old Hickory was beloved, not because Old Hickory uh, insulted people, uh, but because Old Hickory actually was of the frontier, connected to people, had an authenticity about him that people saw and felt in every way. Uh, again, people came by the thousands to his inauguration to shake his hand and feel that connection to him. He didn't have to make that up. He didn't have to pretend he had a large crowd, right? Now, on the warmongering issue, I think you're absolutely right. Much of the growth of presidential power has been about around unchecked war powers. And Congress could and should do a lot more. The Constitution is very clear. Congress declares war. And the Constitution is also very clear. Congress determines where money is spent. The president has no independent budget and no independent way to declare war. Congress has not declared war since 41. The problem is, it's a little bit of a gray area, right? Because the kind of world we're operating in is a world where military action is happening on a continual basis and there's not enough time to wait for Congress. So that's where we get into this complex space. That said, every president you write about here, save for Bill Clinton, was a wartime president. That's correct. That's correct. War has shaped the office and as war has grown, the office has grown. War makes the state, war makes the presidency. And that's, that's, that's why taming war will tame the office. And it is the excessive use of military power that is part of what has made this impossible. Think about it. Uh, more than anything, what undermined Obama's presidency were the range of military commitments he inherited that he could not unwind. That were very, very, very difficult to unwind. He came into office wanting to close Guantanamo. Guantanamo's still there. Right? Trump was also elected to get out of these wars. He's going to end his presidency, we know, with more wars, not with less. Uh, that's part of the problem, that the office is fused in its power to war making, which creates commitments that end up sinking presidencies and sinking the country and bringing us into debt also. Hi, I'm Stanette Rose, and my question is, what is the process that allowed Truman to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? So the, the decision to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were war orders by the commander in chief. So uh, these were, uh, because these were seen as separate weapons, they did go to the president. They didn't do that obviously for every use of military activity. And he authorized them as a military order. Thank you. Sir. Hi, <clears throat> my name's Kurt. Um, 
I'm always trying to find a silver lining in the disaster that we're in right now. And, Me too. Um, <laughs> and one of the things I was thinking kind of about what you were saying before, could Trump's, um, just the fact of having Trump as president diminish the role of the presidency in regards to our foreign affairs and foreign commitments? Because the growth of the presidency of what you're saying is so much based on war in the sense that we have to get involved. There's an expectation the president gets involved in every conflict in the world, Libya, Syria, whatever. But if Trump diminishes America's role, in a sense, our, you know, our prestige, our commitments because of, you know, of who he is, could that then maybe give America less, more of a modest role in the world compared to others than what we are now that could maybe reign in the presidency because we won't be looked on in the rest of the world yeah. as much as a leader as we are now. Can I add something to that as you respond to it? Not just from in the world of foreign policy, but also as, uh, as, as Trump and uh, his ilk seek to sort of hollow out what they call the deep state. So you, you're, you're, you're seeing uh, uh, large parts of uh, cabinet agencies unfilled, uh, agencies not doing some of the things they had traditionally done. Uh, so tackle that from both a, a foreign policy and a domestic policy uh, perspective. Well, I, I do think some humble pie is good for the country. And I'm not sure that, that the president is offering humble pie, but, but some humble pie is good for the country. One of the problems is the problem of hubris, of having so much power and thinking you can solve all problems. And when you're a leader of the free world, you really start to think you are a maker and breaker of the free world, and that's, that, that's part of the problem. But uh, I worry that the hollowing out is actually making the problem worse. Let me talk about that in foreign policy and domestic policy. In foreign policy, it means that we're hollowing out the non-military institutions, like the State Department, and making the military more powerful. Not only are we giving the military more money, the military runs the government right now, right? I mean, we all look to Jim Mattis and H.R. McMaster. So that's actually increasing the use, the presence of the military, which is going to make our policies even more militarized, which is the problem. Same thing at home. Many of the agencies that are being hollowed out, like the EPA and others, are the agencies that do the kind of regulatory work that empower people to find their own solutions in their own communities. As you hollow those out, you actually empower the most powerful interests already, that are also the interests that have direct connections to their financial contributions to the, to the presidency. And so that creates more of the same problems of the powerful overusing their power and a less, less distribution of knowledge, less distribution for innovation. We innovate as a country because we're a free society, but also because we're a well-regulated society. If Austin, Texas did not have a well-regulated, well-managed city, tech entrepreneurs wouldn't be there. If Seattle were not a well-run city, tech entrepreneurs would not be, here, be there. If you hollow that out, uh, you're actually undermining those key elements that provide for opportunity and the distribution of wealth within society. So I think we're going in the wrong direction by hollowing things out. The solution is not less government. The solution is how we focus government resources. We got limited time, so... Unfortunately, this will have to be the last question. Okay. Good evening. My name is Mark Anderson. Uh, without asking you to give away too much about your follow-on books, The Impossible Congress and The Impossible Judiciary, uh, can, uh, can you postulate shortly uh, about your suggested needs and ideas for reforms in the other branches of our federal yes, government? Yes, yes. Great, great. Uh, and, and actually, uh, I'll say the same suggestion uh, for Congress. I'll, the judiciary is a little different. But for Congress, as I had for the presidency, uh, we need younger people in, and we need to break the efforts that have going, gone on for very long now to make Congress less representative. We need to make it more representative. The way it works now is members of Congress choose their constituents. The constituents don't choose them. Gerrymandering has been there since the 18th century. It's named after Elbridge Gerry from Massachusetts. But the scale of it is, has never been seen before like this because of the use of computer technology. We need to make the institution more representative. We need to reduce the number of committees and have the committees focusing on fewer things that matter to us. And members of Congress need to be accountable for having serious policy positions, not for simply parading around uh, in the way that they do. For the judiciary, I, I think we face a real crisis in that our judiciary is actually understaffed, not overstaffed. Most parts of our judiciary have massive case backlogs, and too much goes to arbitration simply because there isn't a legal structure, not enough, not, not, not enough in place. I think we need, to, we need to infuse new funding into the judiciary and bring in a whole new generation of, 
of judges. I think the judiciary actually structurally can work as it is. It's just overburdened uh, right now. And we might be better off not sending to the judiciary questions that really should not be brought to the judiciary. So it should not be up to judges to decide who gets to marry. All citizens should get to marry whoever they want to marry. That should not be a case uh, in the court. I feel the same way about many of the cultural issues. We've, we've freighted our judicial system with difficult cultural issues that distract us from the real jurisprudence that we need around issues of regulation, around issues of legal following the law, and around issues of criminality. But as we, as we seek to staff up the judiciary, uh, you know, we, be mindful that uh, uh, we have some interesting nominees coming from this White House for federal judgeships. Yeah. Well, that's Silver lining, though, is you know, uh, there is uh, a uh, enormously large uh, skewing young, skewing diverse, skewing female, skewing post-9-11 uh, war veteran crop of individuals running for yes. Congress in yes. the 18th cycle. Yeah. So and, and the one thing all of us can do is help support young people going into all of these offices, young people who care, young people who are innovators. There's so much innovative talent in our society, and it's not in our political, congressional, judicial leadership, and it can be there. I'm telling my students that this is their generational calling, and, and we need to encourage that. Uh, let me conclude by offering two rounds of thanks. The first is to, to all of you and to Town Hall. This is a, uh, just a, you know, a remarkable civic institution uh, in our country. Um, and uh, thank you all for your support of Town Hall. It's, uh, it's groups like this that are important to our democracy and uh, civic organizations like this that we need to see more of in, uh, in our communities, large and small. Um, I had the pleasure of reading this book, not, you know, a crash course for tonight, but I read it over the Christmas holidays. Uh, full disclosure, Jeremy's an, an old friend. We went to college together. Um, it's, it's a hell of a book. And so in the intermission between these two programs, Jeremy will be out there uh, signing copies of the book. Uh, I highly recommend it. And I'd like just like to close by saying thank you so much to Jeremy for coming here to Seattle and uh, talking with us tonight. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. Great question. Thank you.